right, today we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to finish the chapter today. So this is verses 8 through 26, current training for the future reigning. And we've covered uh, the sort of the summary of this chapter. Uh, remember, godly, godlessness and worldliness are invading the church, even in Paul's day. So this is roughly 57 AD. And uh, Paul is writing this letter to encourage Timothy to fulfill his responsibility as a leader in the church. And uh, as I've said before, this is particularly for church leaders and deals mainly with their duties. So let's take our little quiz from last week. Uh, true or false, Christians have to be strong. And our strength comes from our desire to always do good and trying harder to obey the Lord. And that's totally false. Uh, you can't do it from your own strength. Uh, Christianity is, uh, is impossible to live that life, which is why God gave us the Holy Spirit to indwell in us. We have God living in us. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. And so we live by the Spirit. This is why it says, tells us to walk in the Spirit because God's strength is inside of us. So we rely on Him. So we walk in the Spirit. That's where our strength comes from. True or false, Paul's instructions to Timothy was to teach the Word occasionally, as time permitted, and basically to just spend time counseling people, you know, individually, because a lot of people had a lot of needs, felt needs that they needed uh, time with, and Paul was a good counselor. So uh, the Word was kind of secondary. Uh, that's totally false. Uh, if you'll remember chapters 1 through 7, it's teach the Word, teach the Word, teach the Word. Uh, Paul can't stress that enough. That's a, that was entirely what his uh, some 30 years of mission work was for Paul, was teaching, teaching, teaching. Uh, true or false, Timothy, and by extension all Christians, was to understand that he was like a soldier engaged in the spiritual warfare that rages around us at all times. He is going to suffer like all soldiers do, but he's not alone in it, and that's true. Timothy was to think like an athlete preparing for the Olympic Games. He should be in training and disciplining himself according to the rules, and that's true. Timothy should also see himself as a hardworking farmer, planting, tending, and harvesting so that he's going to be the first to benefit from his labors, and then others will also benefit. So as Christians, these three things are, are really important for us, considering that we're in a spiritual warfare all the time. We've got to be soldiers dressed up in the armor of God, uh, working like an athlete, being in training and disciplining ourselves all the time, and then also being like hardworking farmers. We've got to be studying and uh, trusting and obeying and praying so that we can uh, reap a good harvest. So that's, uh, that's what that's all about. Okay, first seven verses of chapter two, Paul tells us Timothy where to look for his strength to carry out his marching orders. It's from the grace that's in Christ. That's the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Timothy has relied on Paul pretty heavily, but now Paul is gonna be executed. So based on Paul's 30 or so years of service to Christ, he's got some last words for Timothy and some perspective on ministry that he wants to share with him. And he plants the concepts of soldier, athlete, farmer uh, with Timothy, Timothy to uh, help him get his thinking straight. And Timothy must rely on the strength of the Lord and rekindle his ministry gift. Um, this is where Christians really uh, seem not to quite understand. Christianity is very much an intellectual thinking uh, activity. It, it is not so much a doing, doing, doing kind of thing without the thinking part in place and relying on the Holy Spirit to uh, strengthen us and to give us the power and to guide us into the good works that we, that we are to do. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 26 Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead a descendant of David, such as my gospel, for which I suffer hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal, but God's message is not in prison. Why is Paul in prison to begin with? It was because the Jews who had rejected Jesus as their Messiah hated the gospel of Jesus Christ. They wanted to stop Paul from preaching about him, had trumped up false charges against him to get him arrested and 
hopefully executed. Uh, they had done the same thing with Jesus. Paul was a Roman citizen, and he, uh, rather than letting the Jews basically get in, fall into the hands of the Jews who were not going to give him a fair trial, he, he appealed to Caesar as a Roman citizen. And so he had been sent to Rome to the emperor to keep the Jews from killing him. So as we read about Paul's first imprisonment in the book of Acts, the gospel message didn't get imprisoned with Paul. In fact, Paul's imprisonment in that first time, uh, how he handled it had emboldened the Christians in Rome to spread the gospel message. And after Paul had been released from his first imprisonment, he continued to preach the gospel in new places. But uh, Emperor Nero, uh, quite a character in history, arrested him again in 67 AD and actually had him executed in that fall uh, winter period. So he may have been arrested in Troas where he had left, uh, apparently he'd left a cloak and some important parchments that he's, he's now being held in a dungeon basically. And uh, that cloak would be really important to him because it was pretty cold and dank in that place. Verse 10, so I endure all things for the sake of those chosen by God that they too may obtain salvation in Christ Jesus and its eternal glory. So Paul understood that many of his sufferings is just part of getting the gospel to the Gentiles so that those elect, that is, the freely chosen in Christ by God before the beginning of time, could hear the gospel and by an act of their own will freely choose to be in Christ at a point in time. So this is the doctrine of election. The Bible teaches both election and free will. And although they appear to be contradictory to us in the mind of God, they're not. So the, the Bible never identifies those who are elect from those who are not elect before a person is saved. And we shouldn't either. Christ's death on the cross made it possible for every single person to be saved. And God has said that it is his will that no one should perish. So the gospel message of salvation is available to everyone it's a valid offer to every single person in the world. After all human history is concluded and we live in the eternal kingdom, we will understand that everybody who is there are the elect of God, chosen before the beginning of time. For now, who is elect and who is not should really be of no concern to us, since it is known only to God and to that person who hears the gospel and chooses to be saved. We simply give God's message of the good news of the gospel so that both the elect and non-elect hear it. And then the scripture says, Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's God, it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So gospel preaching, which is the power of salvation to everyone, has to communicate to a lost person the facts that all men are born separated from God by sin are under the condemnation of God, and unless this is remedied while a person has the capability to understand their condition and believe the gospel, it results in eternal separation from God with eternal punishment for their sins in hell or the lake of fire. God has always provided one and only one way of salvation to all people in every age, and it has always been through his revelation to mankind in every age, always it had to be received by means of faith. In this age of the church, the one way of salvation is available to every person through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is 100% God, 100% man, who died for your sins and was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is in the world today convicting people of their need to believe in Christ. Now, for any person to be saved in this age of the church, they must believe this gospel concerning the person and works of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins and was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. This means that they, by an act of their will, place their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Salvation in this context is defined as, it's a term called justification. It's a one-time, irreversible declaration of righteousness by God to that person solely on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for them. So having done this then, 
it is God's power for salvation to everybody who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Salvation in Christ includes the eternal glory of being with God forever and ever, also called eternal life. As soon as you believe, you have this eternal life. And we often think of it not so much as now, but we think about it into the future of living with God forever and ever. This saying is trustworthy. Worthy. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful since he cannot deny himself. Paul may be quoting an early Christian hymn in these verses. He'd done a similar thing in 1 Timothy 1.15. Uh, this one is in a form of Hebrew poetic parallelism with four if clauses, each followed by a balancing conclusion. These were easy to remember. As its title suggests, the words are trustworthy. Basically, you can take these as short doctrinal statements that apply to your sanctification. You can take these to the bank. These are verses for believers, not unbelievers. Unbelievers must first believe the gospel before any of this would apply to them. So just to think through them, if we died with him, we will also live with him. The idea of dying with Christ is spelled out in Romans 6, 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Are we to remain in sin so that uh, grace may increase? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old man was crucified with him so that the body of sin would no longer dominate us so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For someone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he is never going to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires, and do not present your members to sin as instruments to be used for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead, and, and your members to God as instruments to be used for righteousness. For sin will have no mastery over you because you are not under the law, but under grace." So if we endure, we will also reign with him. This is talking about ruling and reigning in the millennial kingdom, where Christ is the king of kings. And depending on our loyalty to him now, loyalty to him now, we will be given areas of responsibility as kings and queens under him in his kingdom. Endure means to stand one's ground, to remain in place. Several scriptures point to this. Revelation 3.21, I will grant the one who conquers permission to sit with me on my throne, just as I too conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And Revelation uh, 5, 9, and 10, you have appointed them as a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Now, if we deny him, he will also deny us. This refers to our practical sanctification. And after we have been saved, uh, did we learn to walk in the Spirit so as to obey all that He commanded us, so have the righteousness of the law fulfilled through us? This is a process of daily fellowship with Christ and long-term growth, or what we call maturity, that begins after we have believed the gospel and while we're still alive on this earth prior to the rapture or our death. This is going to be judged at the Bema Seat Judgment, since this is the only judgment of believers will ever face. At that judgment, we are not judged uh, for our sins, but only on our works. So this person, this is a person who's been justified, that is saved, who denies Christ as his Lord and Master during his sanctification. He quenches and grieves the Holy Spirit, chooses to walk in the flesh instead. 
The result is what Paul describes at the Bema Seat Judgment. We are co-workers belonging to God. You are God's field, God's building, and according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, but someone else builds on it. Each one must be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than what is being laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anybody builds on the foundation <clears throat> with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, <clears throat> each builder's work will be plainly seen. For the day will make it clear, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what kind of work each has done. <clears throat> if what someone has built survives, he will receive a reward. If someone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So during this life, after we're saved, we have a daily choice of how we'd live. That, as Paul says in Galatians, is either by the Spirit or by the flesh. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. <clears throat> if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, since he cannot deny himself. This verse is really important in understanding the previous verse. Even though some believers did not continue in sanctification, but instead went apostate, they did not, by their bad faith, lose what they received by faith in the beginning, which is justification. Jesus always remains faithful. There's a term called once justified, always justified. Some people say once saved, always saved, which can be kind of confusing. <clears throat> the proper uh, way to say this is once justified, always justified. That's your initial uh, salvation. It's when you first believe the gospel and God in heaven declares that you are now uh, justified before him, made you are righteous before him. So this is what you can take from this first. This is your eternal security and your assurance and salvation. You cannot lose your justification. Here's an example. Did Peter, who denied even knowing Christ, not once, but three times, lose his justification? No. There's no scripture that supports Peter having lost his salvation or having to get saved again, nor can you lose your salvation. You did no works to obtain it, and you can do no works to lose it. By the way, the word salvation or saved in the Greek uh, is the word soterios or sozo, has a wide range of meanings depending on its context. And nearly half the time, when you see the word save, uh, saved or salvation in scripture, it had nothing to do with your eternal life. You need to be careful when you read your Bible and you see that word saved. Context is king in interpretation. A lot of the times it has to be delivered from danger uh, or something like that, to be delivered from illness or danger or something like that. It has nothing to do with your eternal salvation. Scripture never tells you to look at yourself for evidence of your justification. You always look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith. And when you do that, you'll have rest and you'll be blessed. Romans 8, 33 through 39. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who will condemn? Christ is the one who died. And more than that, he was raised. Who is at the right hand of God and who also is interceding for us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? As it's written, for your sake we encounter death all day long, and we were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we have complete victory through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor heavenly rulers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation, that would include you, by the way, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you lose your justification? No. Once justified, always justified. We are ready, already considered as glorified once you're justified in the mind of God, since this too is guaranteed. What's not guaranteed is your sanctification, and that is a process over the lifetime of the believer who is in training for the future reigning. 
Each believer's training is what is evaluated at the Bema Seat Judgment by Christ, and that's going to be based on his works while in the body, as discussed above. And as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 3, <clears throat> Paul talks about our part of this sanctification, that we will each be evaluated on it at the judgment seat of Christ. Our appearance there is not optional, as we will all appear at this judgment seat, and Paul describes it this way. For we know that if our earthly house, the tent we live in, our body, is dismantled, dismantled <clears throat> we have a building from God, a house not built by human hands, that is eternal in the heavens. For in this earthly house we groan because we desire to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed after we have put on our heavenly house, we will not be found naked. For we groan while we are in this tent, and since we are weighed down because we do not want to be unclothed but clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. Therefore we were always full of courage, and we know that as long as we are alive here on earth, we are absent from the Lord. <clears throat> For we live by faith and not by sight. Thus we are full of courage and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So then, whether we are alive or away, we make it our ambition to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be paid back <clears throat> according to what he has done while in the body, whether good or evil. Now these two English words, good or evil, need some definition. The word evil here is the word foulon, and it means worthless, compared to good, which is agathon, meaning beneficial. So our works or deeds were either beneficial or worthless in our process of developing loyalty to Christ. That is our training for the future reigning, walking in the spirit, being conformed to the image of Christ. So you might be a great philanthropist and you must, you just love having your name on buildings. Was that a beneficial work or a worthless work in conforming you to the image of Christ? Question is, who got the glory? Well, what looked to us like something that should merit rewards at the Bema seat may be worthless worthless when Christ evaluates it. In the same way, you might use the little money you have supporting a young Bible teacher who's just getting started. He's a sound doctrinal teacher at a small church struggling to feed his family. You supported him. What an encouragement to him. Beneficial work at the Bema seat? Absolutely. Remember, this is not a judgment of sins. Christ already paid that penalty in full. And we're appearing before him with the same righteousness he has imputed to us. He's looking to reward us at this judgment and to give us our future assignments in his kingdom based on our beneficial or good works from the time we were saved until the time we died or were raptured. When you add works as part of justification, you end up with one of these two extreme positions which most churches teach today. They're called Calvinism or Arminianism. So Arminianism teaches that you're justified by faith alone, but if you don't live holy, keep the commandments, endure until the end, then you lose your salvation. Calvinism, the one on the right there, uh, teaches, uh, the guy with the nice beard by the way, Calvinism teaches that you're justified by faith alone, but if you don't live holy, keep the commandments, produce bucket loads of fruit, and endure until the end, that proves you were never saved. So both of these systems are, uh, systems are ultimately saying the same thing. If you don't have works, you're going straight to hell. The only difference is Arminianism front loads works into the finished work of Christ. Calvinism back loads works into the finished work of Christ. Both ultimately teach works-based salvation and deny justification by faith alone. Some churches today are really kind of stealth Calvinists. Here's an example from a what we believe section of a, a popular local church. So here's the way their statement reads. The proper response to the gospel is faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So far, so good. 
a faith that is naturally accompanied by repentance from sin. Biblical repentance is characterized by a changed life, and saving faith is evidenced by kingdom service or works. While neither repentance nor works save, unless a person is willing to deny himself and pick up his cross and follow Christ, he can't become his disciple. This response to the gospel is rooted and grounded in the free and unconditional election of God for his own pleasure and glory. The gospel of grace is to be sincerely preached to all men and all nations. What's right about this statement? The proper response to the gospel is faith in the person and works of Jesus Christ. Everything after it is sort of Calvinistic doctrine. It even includes at the end the idea of unconditional election, which Calvinists, when they say that, they mean that God chose some for salvation and some for condemnation. Those he chose for salvation, he first has to regenerate, and then he gives them the gift of faith, which is why they must have a changed life with good works. They can't help themselves, since the sovereignty of God was what caused them to believe rather than their own free will. This is pretty tricky stuff and puts people under some very unrealistic and unscriptural system. Uh, I would recommend J.B. Hickson's teaching on what is Calvinism and is it biblical, and he has one called Unconditional Election. I've given you the link here. Uh, really, really good to help understand what Calvinism teaches on this unconditional election. Uh, I still believe the doctoral... I don't like Dallas Theological Seminary anymore because they don't stay with what they say they believe, they're teaching stuff that doesn't agree with their own doctrinal statement, but their doctrinal statement is still very sound. So just for comparison purposes, here's uh, about salvation from Dallas Theological uh, Seminary. Um, here's, here's what they say about salvation, and you can compare. We believe that owing to universal death through sin, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again. No degree of reformation, however great. No attainments in morality, however high. No culture, however attractive. No baptism or other ordinance, however administered, can help the sinner to take even one step toward heaven. But a new nature imparted from above, a new life implanted by the Holy Spirit through the Word, is absolutely essential to salvation, and only those thus saved are sons of God. We believe also that our redemption has been accomplished solely by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was made to be sin and was made a curse for us, dying in our room instead, and that no repentance, no feeling, no faith, no good resolutions, no sincere efforts, no submission to the rules and regulations of any church, nor all the churches that have existed since the days of the apostles, can add in the very least degree to the value of the blood or to the merit of the finished work wrought for us by him who united in his person true and proper deity with perfect and sinless humanity. We believe that the new birth of the believer comes only through faith in Christ and that repentance is a vital part of believing and is in no way in itself a separate and independent condition of salvation, nor are any other acts such as confession, baptism, prayer, or faithful service to be added to believing as a condition of salvation. Now, the extent of salvation, we believe that when an unregenerate person exercises that faith in Christ, which is illustrated and described as such in the New Testament, he passes immediately out of spiritual death and into spiritual life, and from the old creation into the new, being justified from all things, accepted before the Father according as Christ his Son is accepted, loved as Christ is loved, having his place and portion as linked to him and one with him forever. Though the saved one may have occasion to grow in the realization of his blessings and to know a fuller measure of divine power through his yielding of his life more fully to God, he is, as soon as he is saved, in possession of every spiritual blessing and absolutely complete in Christ and is therefore in no way required by God 
to seek a so-called second blessing or a second work of grace. Now, here's the sanctification part. We believe that sanctification, which is a setting apart unto God, is threefold. It's already complete for every saved person because his position toward God is the same as Christ's position. Since the believer is in Christ, he is set apart unto God in the measure in which Christ is set apart unto God. We believe, however, that he retains his sin nature, which cannot be eradicated in this life. Therefore, while the standing of the Christian in Christ is perfect, his present state is no more perfect than his experience in his daily life. Therefore, there is therefore a progressive sanctification wherein Christian, the Christian is to grow in grace and to be changed by the unhindered power of the Spirit. We believe also that the child of God yet will be fully sanctified in his state that he is now sanctified in his standing in Christ when he shall see the Lord and shall be like him. Now, what it's saying in sanctification is your daily experience is whether or not you're choosing to walk in the Spirit or not. Paul says there are Christians who do not choose to walk in the Spirit, but choose to walk in the flesh. Galatians 5, uh, 16 is a warning to all Christians to choose to walk in the Spirit and not walk in the flesh, because when you walk in the flesh, you look just like a pagan. And there are many Christians who do that. Now, what the Calvinists say is when, you, when you're doing that, that's evidence that you're, you're really not um, uh, a disciple. You're, it's, it's almost like you're unsaved. Uh, it, it just doesn't go together. You're, and so they're always looking for you to be producing fruit. Uh, they're sort of fruit inspectors all the time. It's kind of a not, a, not a fun place to go to church, uh, but I would think. Verse 14, remind people of these things and solemnly charge them before the Lord not to wrangle over words. This is of no benefit. It just brings ruin on those who listen. Remind people of these things. Remind which people? Of what things? Well, people refers back to the faithful men that Timothy is to entrust with sound doctrine so they can teach and they can also entrust it to other faithful men to teach. The what are the things Paul just stated that are trustworthy sayings about your sanctification that we just read. Those four short if-then doctrinal statements. If we died with him, then we will also live with him. If we endure, uh, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he'll also deny us. If we're unfaithful, he remains faithful since he cannot deny himself. That's basic Christian doctrine, simply stated that Paul says is trustworthy. You can believe this without hesitation. Solemnly charge them before the Lord not to wrangle over words. Solemnly charge these teachers, uh, dia martyromenas, uh, a present tense middle voice verb. It means to testify through and through. Uh, a charge uh, earnestly before the Lord has the sense of raise your right hand and do you solemnly swear that what you're about to say is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you God. They're charged not to wrangle over words. And we've seen this before in relationship with how Timothy was to deal with the false teachers. Reject those myths fit only for the godless and gullible and train yourself for godliness. So the context here is as a faithful teacher, don't get sucked into controversies and wars on words with the false teachers. Simply reject them, move on with sound doctrine. Seems the false teachers always have a different take on what the word of God means than does the sound doctrinal teacher. This is especially true today since most of the false teachers do not believe in the inspiration, inerrancy, and sufficiency, and authority of the Bible to begin with. Few of them even, even bother to study using the original language texts and tools available to them or the commentaries of biblicists who have devoted lifetimes of study to the Word. They read their favorite English translation to, to sometimes and decide what that means to them what does the Bible mean to me? That's not the way you read the Bible, by the way. It's what does the Bible mean? Uh, what the means to them without any attempt at the science of interpretation called hermeneutics. If they don't really trust this to be God's word, they don't have a solid interpretive approach. They can make the Bible speak like they think 
or what they want it to say. They teach it like the current culture would like to hear it. Paul tells Timothy to charge the sound teachers to not get into debates with them. You and I today need to be very discerning what these men are saying and teaching. Most of them are very slick and slippery and hard to pin down. One of the best ways to identify them is to listen to a lot of sound doctrine being taught by true biblicists so that you can compare. It's like, how do you tell an authentic $20 bill from a counterfeit? If you don't know what the real one looks like, what the markers of the authentic one are, how the real one feels compared to the fake, you can easily be taken, uh, deceived. An example of one of the most popular preachers of our time is Andy Stanley. He's one of the well-known, uh, son of the well-known Baptist preacher, Charles Stanley. Andy Stanley draws about 50,000 people a weekend to North Point Church in the Atlanta area. Here is what they say about themselves. North Point Ministry was founded in 95 with a version of creating churches that unchurched people love. Now, is that what you want your church to be? Since its inception, North Point Ministry has grown from one church to eight in Metro Atlanta and has developed a global network of more than 150 partner churches. Wow. Each week, more than 50,000 people attend services in person or online in our Atlanta area churches. Each month, sermons and leadership messages are accessed over one million times via our websites. Through our methods, uh, though our methods have evolved over the years, the mission has always been to inspire people to follow Jesus. It's what we do. Whether at our Atlanta area churches, at our partner churches around the world, or through, uh, through our many online and broadcast offerings. Along the way, we're committed to equipping other church leaders that want to create churches, create churches, and remember this is the Lord's church, create churches unchurched people would love by passing on what we've learned. So something not quite right about that, if you think about it. A few things that you should know about Andy Stanley and should make you question whether you would ever listen to another word this guy has to say. Uh, just pick these off the internet. A couple years ago, Andy Stanley taught, if somebody can predict their own death and their own resurrection, I'm not at all concerned about how they got into the world. He went on to say, Christianity doesn't hinge on the truth or even the stories around the birth of Jesus. So basically he's saying the virgin birth, not a big deal to him. So that's, uh, that's sort of a problem theologically, don't you think? Since 2016, Stanley has minimized the importance of the virgin birth of Christ. He said maybe the thought is they had to come up with some kind of a myth about the birth of Jesus to give him some street cred later on. Maybe that's where that came from. Uh, if you believe scripture, uh, it's not street cred, it's not a myth. Are you calling the virgin birth of Christ a myth? Andy Stanley teaches that believers should, in his own words, unhitch themselves from portions of the Old Testament scripture. I thought all, all scripture uh, was, was important for us to study and to understand. He teaches that unity is more important than theology. Well, that's what the one world religion will certainly teach. Stanley holds a tolerant view of homosexuality. He says he has no intention of pushing a Christian agenda on other people. So the Bible's not there to, for correction and uh, so forth. Stanley holds a, uh, his book, uh, Deep and Wide, is a pandering and unbiblical effort to create irresistible experiences irresistible experiences, and a brand of watered-down consumer-centric religion that unchurched people would want to attend. At one place in the book, Stanley makes fun of other churches and pastors who insist on preaching the truth and not following the winds of culture. Great stuff. Andy Stanley allows women, Beth Moore, for example, to take his pulpit and preach to his congregation. That, that's surely scriptural, isn't it? So one of the men who has developed the leadership programs for pastors and elders to build churches like North Point, he's worked there for 20 years under Andy Stanley, is a man named Clay Scroggins. He's just been named the interim pastor at Crossroads Christian Church in Grand Prairie, Texas. We used to go to church there, and several of you listening have used to go to church there. You can look for Crossroads Christian Church. I'm, I'm 
predicting this, to take on the model of North Point and the type of teaching that Andy Stanley teaches and the result I am thinking is going to be explo uh, explosive growth at Crossroads listening to false teachers tickling their ears. Make every effort to present yourself before God as proven a worker who does not need to be ashamed teaching the message of truth accurately. Timothy was to be a model for this. From this model, others were to model themselves. You've heard of the youth programs in churches called Awana. That name comes from here, a worker approved and not ashamed. It should be ec uh, excellent for the youth, but this first and foremost applies to those of us who are supposed to be the adults in the room. Those who are in positions of elders and deacons in the church should be approved workers. Those who teach and lead small groups should be workers approved. Those who have been Christians for at least five years, Paul's estimate of how long it takes to train a Christian, should be workers approved. It's a good thing to assess where you attend church, starting at the top. One way to do this is to study the About section of the church's website. Elders generally are responsible for publishing a doctrinal statement of what we believe. Many of them today are hiding it or abbreviating it to the point where you have no idea what, whether the elders are workmen approved, whether they teach sound doctrine or not, what they hold to be true as the systematic theology behind their teaching, which are the doctrines of God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, man, angels, Satan, demons, salvation, Israelology, ecclesiology, and eschatology. What, what is their approach uh, to the Bible interpretation, their view of inerrancy, inspiration, authority, sufficiency of Scripture, what they understand the mission and vision of the church is, what they teach is, what must a person do to be justified, what their eschatological view is, what their view and urgency is concerning training the saints for the future reigning, are they part of a recognized denominational system that shapes their teaching, and so forth. The other way is to ask for face-to-face -face meeting and have a list of interview questions prepared. My first question would always be, what would you tell me I have to do to be justified? If it includes any works that I must do, rather than simply trust in the person and finished works of Christ who died for my sins and rose again from the dead, interview's over, I'm not gonna go to that church. If they can't get the simple gospel right, uh, in other words, they tell me I've gotta confess my sins, ask Jesus into my heart, commit to making Jesus Lord of my life, or some other nonsense, interview would end and I'd move on to another church. If they get the gospel right, next question would be, what do you teach concerning the creation, fall, flood, and Noahic covenant. If they don't teach a literal six-day creation account, a literal fall of man, a literal global flood, and a literal covenant that God made with Noah, interviews over. The entire rest of the Bible is interpreted through a proper interpretation of Genesis 1 through 11. If that's wrong, their teaching on the doctrines of God, man, sin, suffering, redemption, and the kingdom is going to be wrong. If those are correct, I'd ask what their teaching is on the Abrahamic uh, covenant, the land covenant, Davidic covenant, new covenant, Mosaic covenant, and the future of Israel is. The current purpose of the church, the future of the church, the current function of Christ and the status of his kingdom. What do they teach about those things? If they blow any of these key portions of God's plan of the ages, interviews over. They tell me we're in a form of the kingdom now, some kind of spiritual form, and then what we are doing is kingdom work, bringing in the kingdom so Christ can return. When we've got everything done, they don't understand God's plan of the ages. Interview over. Goodbye. Here's the problem. I'm not going to find a church very soon, and I'll be obligated to practice the doctrine of separation until I do. I'll not attend a church that teaches false doctrine or is apostate just to have face-to-face -face fellowship with people who do not hold to sound doctrine. I don't like it being this way, and I'm praying God will put a true biblical church within reach for us where we can have fellowship with other believers. But until then, we're going to have to continue online with pastors and churches who have it right. But avoid profane chatter because those occupied with it stray further and further into ungodliness, and their message will spread its infection like gangrene. Hymenaeus and Philetus are in this group. This is a problem. What is profane chatter? Well, profane is the Greek word bibelos, meaning that which lacks all relationship or affinity to God. The word chatter is kinophonia, meaning empty sounds. First Timothy, Paul warned Timothy several times about this, which was coming from the false teachers. 
seems to have been a characteristic of the false teachers that they were what they were saying was empty of meaning in relation to what was right or holy concerning God. But apparently they were popular and what they had to say appealed to people who were occupied with it. You find people like this today. Rather than spending time listening to sound teaching, they seem to find fringe false teachers and they get on board with them. They recommend them to their friends, they pass them on to others as if they just found something new and exciting that's a breakthrough in theology that nobody's ever thought of before. These are the people who lead people astray into further ungodliness, asabias, acting against God and his will for the saints. It spreads like gangrene, infecting like an eating sore. That's the definition of gangrene. Two men in particular called out, and that's the profane chatter, Hymenaeus and Philetus. They've strayed from the truth by saying that the resurrection has already occurred. They're undermining some people's faith. Well, what about these two guys? They've been teaching false doctrine. They were telling everybody that the resurrection of the saints as part of the rapture had already taken place. So basically everybody there in Ephesus had missed the rapture of the church. They were heading into the end times, the day of the Lord's wrath, including the tribulation. That's totally contrary to what Paul taught them about the rapture. The church is not gonna see the wrath of God or the day of the Lord's wrath because prior to it, the dead in Christ are gonna be resurrected first. Those alive are gonna be translated. Both are gonna meet the Lord in the air when he returns at the end of the church age to deliver us from that day. We are to be encouraging each other with this revelation God gave through Paul. These two guys were teaching falsely that everybody missed it. What a blow to the faith that these guys had struck. However, God's foundation remains standing, bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his and everybody who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from evil. Despite all the apostasy and heresy going on, God's foundation still stands firm. The men who teach sound doctrine are becoming fewer and fewer, and it seems God is in the final days of separating the true church from the apostate church. The Lord knows who are his by definition of the doctrine of election. Those who believe the gospel in the end are the elect, the choice ones of God. Everyone will have had their opportunity to believe and none were prevented from believing or never had a chance to believe. After time ends, the eternal state begins. All who enter eternity are the elect of God. While time exists, we have no idea who the elect are until they believe the gospel. While time exists, it makes no difference to us who is the elect and who is not because we have been commanded to preach the gospel to everyone. And every single person on church will have, uh, on earth will have had the opportunity to believe it and be saved. Even at the end of the tribulation, an angel goes throughout the earth with the eternal gospel, reaching every person one last time with one last opportunity to believe and be saved. Now in a wealthy home, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also ones made of wood and of clay. Some are for honorable use, others for ignoble use. So if someone cleanses himself of such behavior, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Uh, this is kind of a difficult passage to interpret, and I'm going to uh, rely on Dr. Tom Constable's notes for this. Paul employed a different illustration to emphasize the same point. In the church, there are individuals who honor the Lord as a result of their dedication to follow his truth. These people are useful to the Lord in his work because their commitment to his word prepares them for his service. However, there are also Christians who, because of their lack of commitment to God's truth, bring dishonor on him while they seek to be his instruments of service, uh, e.g. false teachers. If somebody avoids the defilement of this second group, he or she can be a member of the first group. Verse 22, but keep away from youthful passes, pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love, peace, in company with others who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So as mentioned before, Timothy's still a relatively young man, so youthful passions could be something that would be a trap for Timothy. Instead, he should pursue these things that would keep him on track, and he should stay in fellowship with others who are pursuing the same kinds of things. Verse 23, reject foolish and ignorant controversies because you know they breed infighting. Sometimes the best thing a Bible teacher can do is just not join the fight over foolish or ignorant controversies people get into. Many of those do lead to serious fights and divisions in the church. And the Lord's slave must not engage in heated disputes, but be kind toward all, 
an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance and the knowledge of the truth, and they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap where they're held captive to do his will. He is likewise, uh, you know, not to be quarrelsome and argumentative towards others. That requires maturity, some people skills that are developed over time. It is to be tactful, which is the art of making a point without making an enemy. Being able to do that biblically allows God's word to work in the heart and mind of a person to allow them to change their minds and come to the truth. The world is held in the grip of lies by the father of lies, Satan. It's only when the spirit of God, the spirit of truth that penetrates their thinking, are they able to escape his hold on them so that they can be free to do the will of God. A few applications, there's emphasis in this chapter on the gospel message being taught. Even in Paul's day, the false teachers were teaching false gospels. The first book Paul wrote was Galatians, and he says that there's only one gospel, the one he preaches, the one he received directly from Christ. He says anyone, even an angel from heaven, that tries to teach another gospel is to be cursed. In this lesson, we looked at the gospel, that gospel and stated it clearly as Paul did and showed you how it is misstated by a local church and also clearly stated for comparison. We're charged to preach the right gospel to all the world, so we better get it right. Jeremy Thomas is currently doing a teaching series called The Basics. Here's a link to uh, that one that makes the gospel very clear. The teaching portion uh, begins at about 25 minutes. It's a church service, and so uh, they have their regular service going on, and then at about 25 minutes, he comes uh, to teach. So here's that link. Also in the, this lesson, we saw the doctrine of election. The Bible teaches this doctrine, but it also teaches the doctrine of free will. These seem to be contradictory to our minds, but not God's. I stated it sort of in this way. God freely chose some people to be in Christ in eternity past, and those he chose freely chose to be in Christ at a point in time. This is not unconditional election as Calvinists define it, they mean God sovereignly chose those he saved uh, to be saved. He regenerated them, and then he gave them the gift of faith, uh, unconditioned on anything they did. The more accurate teaching on, on election would be undeserved election, which means God freely chose those for salvation, not based on any merit of their own, but on the sole condition that the person exercise his free will to have faith in the gospel message available to them at the time. The last application here is not to get into arguments and disputes with false teachers. We present the truth of scripture based on applying proper interpretive skills. That's the science of interpretation called hermeneutics. So as to rightly divide the word of God, literally, grammatically, contextually, historically, identifying the plan of God for Israel, plan of God for the church, plan of God for the kingdom, all for the glory of God. And when you understand the meta narrative of the Bible, the big story of the Bible, from the first Adam and his disobedience to the last Adam and his perfect obedience, and you can see then how history is his story, you are closing in on understanding God's word is truth. Maranatha, see you next time.